In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Tonight is our 28th class, our Orthodox Survival Course. This is our second class on the book Nihilism by Father Seraphim Rose, or who at the time when he wrote it was Eugene Rose, a layman. And tonight we're going to read part of chapter two, the stages of the nihilist dialectic. As I said last week, I wasn't sure how long it's going to take us to get through this. And when I was working on the notes today, spending a few hours studying this and working through this, we were able to produce five pages of notes on just the first two stages of the nihilist dialectic. Father Seraphim identified four stages, liberalism, what he called liberalism, realism, vitalism, and then destructive nihilism, nihilism of destruction, the ultimate, you might say, nihilism. And um, tonight we're going to talk about stages one and two, liberalism and realism. Um, I did, I do have a hard copy of the book this week, and I do have page numbers in the notes as well as paragraph numbers. The paragraph numbers refer to the paragraph within that section. So in the introduction section, there are um, so many paragraphs, five paragraphs. In the liberalism section, um, I give the page numbers, but also within the liberalism section, I give the paragraph numbers. Then start over again with the realism section with paragraph numbers. So if you're reading online, reading the book online, you can go by the paragraph numbers. If you're reading hard copy, also you can refer to the page numbers at the beginning of each section. In the very first um, section here, the introduction, the author points out there's a unified nihilist mentality, but it has different manifestations. It's all these, these four stages are really four manifestations, are four schools of thought related to a few basic shared beliefs, the demons, realities. The demons yes, the demons have different, they put on different masks, they, they have different, or they're, all, they're all demons, but they're all serving the devil. They're all following the same program, more or less, but they have different manifestations. And it's advanced on different fronts. So this revolution, or this, this nihilistic overturning of everything, is moving on different fronts. And he's divided it into four stages. Roughly, we could identify four historical periods where one front or one type of nihilism is more prominent or seems to be the most powerful or the most evident. And in a way, it's, it's a change from one stage to another. So that's why he uses the word stages, which indicates a chronological prog- progression. But at the same time, um, we, re- we recognize that these stages overlap and that some stages appear out of time, I'd say earlier than the evolutionary process would, would indicate. For example, the most obvious example is the French Revolution, which is nihilism of destruction, which he identifies as the last stage. But then there's, we know that from our study of the 19th century, there was a reaction pushing back the French Revolution. But, and so what took, stage, what took center stage for a while in the 19th century is what he calls the first stage of nihilism, which is liberalism. Or, would, to, or to make that more specific and more precise, today we should call it classic liberalism or 19th century liberalism. So this nihilism having different stages, different faces, different heads of the hydra, this confuses people trying to oppose it. It might confuse us, we're trying to oppose it. And the, you're trying to oppose this nihilism, then you see this face of nihilism that seems nicer or friendlier. Say, so, well, I guess I'll identify with that. I'll, I'll enjoy that. For example, I talk to Orthodox people who enjoy watching like some so-called conservative talk shows or things like that or listening to that. And they say, well, you know, this is much better than um, the far left uh, Democrats and so forth. And I say, yes, that's true. But you have to realize this is another face of the revolution. This is another head of the Hydra. And so even though you may say, well, yes, uh, practically, I'll vote for this more conservative, quote-unquote, guy rather than the other one, you have to realize that this is just uh, an earlier stage or a less lethal stage, but nevertheless part of the same program. Okay. I've, yes, I actually have gotten, I've won them, o- won over some people to understand they have to advance to a more, a more orthodox and a more um, precise, more informed understanding of what's going on. So they don't just caught in the American false dialectic of, you know, Democrat versus Republican or conservative versus liberal and so forth. So one stage, in a sense, prepares for the next, or leads to the next, but on the other hand, we have to recognize that the later stage incorporates the error of the previous age. So these these are errors piled on errors. They incorporate the previous error. (coughs) And these two schools of error, or four schools of error, might criticize each other. But remember, that's like the demons talking in our heads to each other. We we could have 
ten demons trying to talk in our heads, and they seem to be contradicting each other. But it's all—they're all demons, you see. And so all, all these all these different schools of error might debate, criticize. You can you can fill a library with uh, Marxist critiques of liberal history, or liberal critiques of Marxist history. But they're all people in error criticizing each other. And the orthodox view is above, and all these views, and is true. It's the true view. So we have to, as I've been saying frequently through our course, we have to stay on our orthodox vantage point and look down on all this, right? We have to have our orthodox lens through which we see all this and not get caught up in uh, emotional or violent identification with uh, an error that might seem or, or is less on the fa surface, less pernicious than a, a more advanced error, but is nevertheless part of the complex of errors. So the proponents of the previous stage may oppose or appear to oppose the next stage. They're posing as the conservatives of that day. You know, G.K. Chesterton, the English Catholic writer, made a quip. Well, he made a lot of jokes. He has a lot of great one-liners. But he said, the, um, the progressives or the liberals are the people who make the changes, and the conservatives conserve the changes. Previous. The previous changes. So at every step, the so-called conservatives are just preser conserving the, the old errors. <laughs> the progressives are always making new errors, and the conservatives are conserving the old errors. See, so it's that's that's their job in the in the in the process. Okay. Um, at every stage, there are partial truths. Okay, and so every remember, there's no such thing as absolute untruth. Like there's no such thing as absolute evil. There's no such thing as absolute untruth. You could read uh, a Marxist critique of uh, capitalist economics, and you could say, well, yeah, there are some correct insights. These are if there were no correct, if there were no truths, no partial insights, nothing that rang true then none of these schools of thought would seduce people, right? They had to seduce people by, by gradually introducing partial truths that became more and more untrue as time went on, right? They, they, in other words, excuse me, greater and greater untruths. The old, the old ones didn't become more untrue, they're always untrue, but greater and greater untruths, but starting out with small little lies and then advancing to the bigger lies. And that's how they seduce people and get them to cooperate the cheese. with their program. The cheese in the trap. The cheese in the trap. That's right. And then you, then you move the cheese a little bit, and <laughs> and the, the little victims keep following, right? Um, but they pretend the groups pretend to criticize each other, but no so-called mainstream criticism ever gets at the root of the problem. When you get at the root of the problem, they tell you you're not mainstream, you're fringe, um, you're too radical, you're living in the past, or something like that. If you go at the root of the problem. Okay? Um, so, Father Seraphim identifies the four stages. In paragraph two, he names the four stages. And that's on page 21 in the book. By the way, this is the second edition of the book. I think we all own the second edition of the book, which has an additional um, essay on the philosophy of the absurd at the end, which we're not going to spend time on. But absur absurdism is part and parcel, of course, of nihilism. Um, I think in Romania you had one of the most famous absurdists, the playwright UNESCO. Yes. Um, so Father Seraphim identifies these four stages as liberalism, realism, vitalism, and destruction, or nihilism of destruction, just out-and-out -out nihilism, just the consistent nihilism of just destroying everything, not pretending to have a positive program, but just destroying everything. Right. This term liberalism, uh, right now in 2018, this term liberalism uh, needs to be uh, identified precisely. Today, and if you're watching uh, television or reading the press, uh, they say, well, the Democrats and the leftists are the liberals and the, cons the Republicans are the conservatives. Right? At best, at best, the Republicans are classic liberals, classical liberals, at best. Okay? They're classical liberals. The Democrats today are just the uh, Satanists or destroyers, right? They're just, they're just out there in the streets, you know, funding Antifa and, and uh, riots and... and uh, transgenderism and uh, the whole program of just overt destruction, right? They're just into overt destruction. So they're really not, they're really, today's so-called leftists or so-called liberals are not liberals. They're just nihilists or, um, uh, I'd say, hardcore uh, Marxist destroyers. And the so-called conservatives, uh, at the most, uh, about the most conservative you'll find, will, are, would be people that we should identify as classical liberals, 19th century liberals, or about as conservatives against in today's American um, political spectrum. So who are these conservatives? I mean, excuse me, who are these liberals? The height of liberalism, it's, it's high tide, it's, its apex is the, height, the middle of the 19th century, the, uh, the Victorian era, 
in England and in Europe. Okay? The liberals were those who taught, uh, you know, they were optimistic about the pr progress of man, but at the same time, uh, they wanted to conserve the good things from what they would call Christian civilization. Without God. Without God. Or with a very tame God. I mean, God's there, but he's the, de the God of deism, the God who's off somewhere but doesn't interfere with things, doesn't interfere with our program to improve the world. The liber oh, another, another term for classical liberals are simply what today are called um, libertarians. The idea that you just let people, leave people alone, take away, all their, take away all the old rules, take away all the old boundaries, take away all the old authorities, let people just interact and do business with each other and um, fulfill their potential, all will go well. Let's say, so it was the liberals in, in politics in the 19th century, it was the liberals who, who gradually uh, removed all the authority of the kings in peaceful ways through establishing constitutional monarchy and well usually in peaceful ways the there were revolutionaries who who, who enacted violent revolution but in the so-called uh, advanced countries or more democratic countries it was basically the liberals who established a program of universal suffrage um, the income tax compulsory public education which are all actually aspects of the of Marx's Communist Manifesto, but it was under the, under the auspices of the liberals, saying this is good for people and we're making progress. If you tell them they're communists, what are you talking about? Yeah, tell people who believe in the income tax they're and communists. We lived in communism. Yeah, you so lived in communism. Yeah. yeah, compulsory we public see education. Yeah, we see it. Compulsory public education, um, uh, destroying private property through getting people into debt and taxes and so forth. It's all part of the Marxist program. But in the 19th century. This is enacted under progressivist or liberal auspices, right? They were helping the masses. They were lifting up the oppressed classes through, through liberal legislation. And they were establishing, instead of monarchy, constitutional monarchy, right? The power was not from God to the king, but it was from the people, supposedly from the people. So liberalism was at its height in the middle of the 19th century. Realism, which we could also call uh, determinist materialism, or radical ma philosophical materialism, or scientism, he identifies its, its, the height of its public cachet, so to speak, the latter half of the 19th century. That's the, 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 high, the, the high tide of the, 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 um, the triumph of Darwinism and, and that kind of thing. And then vitalism, the last quarter of the 19th century up to World War I. Vitalism um, was a movement of uh, they, they were kind of bored with this crude scientific materialism. So they wanted to recapture the idea of the human spirit. Colonies. Pardon me? Colonies. The colonies? Africa. And so forth. Yes, that's right. These are the people interested in the s savage races. They were bored with being uh, uptight Victorian Europeans. They wanted to go rediscover their, um, their animal nature, right, by hanging out with they the Orientalists and the Africanists. Uh, the novels, uh, very degenerate literature associated with people like E.M. Forster um, focused on this um, exploration, the bored Englishmen exploring more vital cultures where they were in touch with their animal instincts. And uh, this also vitalism affected uh, even military thinking. For example, the, the French leading up to World War I, the French had a disastrous suicidal concept of the offensive outrance, the uh, the, the uh, total offensive um, with no thought of defensive or logistical considerations based on the concept of the élan vital that the French, and it was also a, raci a racialist concept, we French have greater élan, we have greater courage, we have greater vital energy than, than the Germanic race. And so we will defeat them. We're going to wear red, we're going to keep wearing our bright red pants and, um, and doing cavalry and infantry charges against entrenched German uh, machine gun emplacements because our elan vital will overcome uh, their 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 um, their technology, which of course is is absurd, right? It's it's ridiculous. But people, you know, as they say, when you stop believing in the real God, you'll believe anything. So these are all a whole number of ridiculous mini ideologies sprang out of this one trunk of the denial of Christian truth. That's vitalism, and we were discussing last week the um, the uh, apostle of vitalism is. Uh, a, a, um, a philosopher named Henri Bergson. Uh, uh, Henri is a French name, but he wasn't exactly French. Um, he taught at the University of Paris, and um, he had this concept. He was an evolutionist, 
and he but he taught this mystical concept of evolution in which the uh, the the uh, the the elan vital is incarnated in each successive stage of the evolutionary process, and it's 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 a it's an unstoppable process moving forward where life leaps on the back of non-life, and then more more complex life uh, leapfrogs over that, and then and then animals, and then man, and, and then and then of course ultimately there's something beyond man, right? There's a transhuman or a superman that comes comes after that. Um, pardon me. Cyborgs. So, well, well, uh, well. Bergson was thought it would just be an evolutionary process, right? Or he said he did. Who knows what he really thought? Um, <laughs> it's a good living. Um, <laughs> un unfortunately, unfortunately, a lot of young Orthodox, the best, the cream of Orthodox young people, intellectuals, were attracted to Europe at this period. And they were sitting in, in Bergson's lectures, and they were sitting in all these lectures, and they were bringing this crazy stuff back, right, to their own country. But that, that's, that's a topic when we talk about, we're going to talk about the Orthodox nations and their, um, our situation, right, in, in the 20th century and, and then the 21st century. And then there's finally the, the, the out-and-out uh, nihilism of destruction. Let's just destroy it. Let's just destroy everything, because that's the ultimate end of all this. Um, th this is what's portrayed in the, the possessed or the demons by Dostoevsky, right? Just the out and out nihilists who just say, yeah, we're just, we just hate everybody and everything. We're just demonic and we just, we're going to enjoy killing everybody and destroying everything. And, and that's really, that's incarnated in the, 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 the frenzy of destruction in the 20th century, right? Real wars, revolutions, um, millions of people being killed by their own governments. It, it's a demonic frenzy. Why, why would, you know, other than a demonic impulse why would you annihilate 60 million people in russia why would you annihilate 90 million people in china it's it's demonic no no earthly no earthly evil can explain this this kind of thing but it, it is it is linked to on the in the the public face though is linked to these so-called philosophical positions and if you get enough people believing this stuff they're going to go along with it right they're going to go along with it because uh, one, one. I, I'd like to coin a phrase. I've been thinking a lot about this and thinking about um, problems within orthodoxy, and I'm going to coin the phrase: homology begets ontology. Homology, H O M O L O G Y. That's from the Greek homologia, what you profess, what you believe. It's a theological way of of, of expressing ideas of consequences. Okay? So, what you believe begets or creates who you are. It changes who you are. It's like Weaver says, ideas have consequences. So if you get enough people to believe these bad ideas, it changes how they function, how they live together, ultimately what they are. Okay? We know that in, in theologically, our homologia, our confession of faith, changes us ontologically. Grace changes us. It transforms us. Right? And when we confess the faith, we say the creed three times at our baptism, we go in the font, come out three times, we're changed. That confession of faith changes us. And to deny your faith, if you become an apostate, that's not just a... Those aren't just words, right? And it changes who you are on the inside. It changes what you are. Okay? So this philosophical, this brainwashing over generations of all the formerly Christian peoples of Europe and America, it's actually changed what they are. Their homology begat, their negative, or their giving up their homology, their homologia, their confession of the faith, begat a new negative ontology, what they are. <clears throat> Yes, the intellectual state is very low, so you have to you have to go straight to the heart. You have to you have to bypass the rational function and go straight to their instinct of and and hope that God's grace touches their hearts. Yeah, well, they go straight to their souls, which is why we have to fight with spiritual weapons. That's right. Right, but but people who do have who do have rational function left, we have to reach them. That's why the purpose of our course is to reach our faithful who still have their rational functions are still working because we need, some, we still need to retain, to preserve, save some kind of elite who will have a rational understanding. Otherwise, we'll, we won't have any leadership. Yeah, that's why it's important to preserve our children and preserve their, their, their minds. So we have some future, some rational people left who can, who can provide a rational leadership. Okay. So in paragraph three of the introduction, uh, Father Seraphim points out that the stages overlap and representatives of each kind can be found in every stage. So in the French Revolution, you can find one of each kind. Right? In the, the mid-19th century in France or Germany or Russia, you can find one of each kind. See? Even today, in 2018, we still have liberals, we still have realists, we still have vitalists, even though we're well past 
the era when the nihilism of destruction took center stage with the big wars and the, the big violent revolutions. Okay. He also points out how even though these errors, he identifies these errors as having their root in the French Revolution in the 19th century, but he points out they have precedents. Remember, there's no such thing as really a new idea. They're, all, they're always recycling old bad ideas. Right? So he says each kind of nihilism has historical precedent, that liberalism has roots in Renaissance humanism. The liberals are very into being humanistic. Man is the center of all things. The beauty of human achievement, the beauty of human culture, and so forth and so on. Which seems right, seems beautiful, right? It's attractive. It's not destructive. It's beautiful and it's attractive. You know, everybody admires Renaissance art and architecture and music and so forth. Man is the center of all things. Leonardo da Vinci, Michelangelo, on and on. And the, the liberals of the 19th century recycle all this in their own way. Um, realism or, or scientism or uh, scientific determinism, philosophical materialism, all terms we could equate with so-called realism, has roots in the Reformation and the Enlightenment, in, in the you know in 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 the Reformation, you know that they want to they want to do away with tradition and just have just study the Bible, right? That's the evidence. We're going to remember that Luther's favorite philosopher was Occam, who's a nominalist, and, and nominalism is a is a precursor of ultimately of empiricism and then and then positivism or realism, and the Enlightenment, of course, in the light in the Enlightenment era, you have the radical empiricists, all, concluding with David Hume, the Scot David Hume, who says that all all reality is known. Are the only thing you can know is through your sense experience, and no two sense experiences. You can't prove any two sense experiences are even related. So life is just a series of disconnected sense experiences. Okay. So that's uh, so Hume is thought of as, as an Enlightenment thinker, uh, a radical, uh, uh, the radical British empiricist. But that, and that's a precursor of the 19th century positivism or realism. And vitalism, this idea of getting in touch with your dark mystical side, your animal nature, see, that has roots in Renaissance and Enlightenment occultism and romanticism. Remember we talked about earlier, weeks ago, we talked about the Renaissance and their fascination with the occult, getting in touch with mystical dark power in the, on the Jewish side of the Kabbalah and then in general with alchemy and uh, the occult numerology and uh, pseudo-mysticism of uh, the Renaissance, uh, some of the Renaissance people who are famous externally as philosophers and politicians and scientists, but on the inside or secretly they were occultists. Pico della Mirandola, Francis Bacon, Newton. Pardon me. Newton. Newton. Yeah. And well, Newton's an Enlightenment figure, but the same. It's the same. Same stuff. Yeah. Part of the part of the club. Right. So and Romanticism uh, in the early early nineteenth century Romanticism. Is this, uh, is this revolt against rationalism and empiricism, the desire to experience your emotions, experience your, your, con your mystical connection with nature, and so forth. And that, but but the, ro the romantics are all tied, also tied in with various occult groups. Okay. Uh, Mary Shelley, the author of Frankenstein, for example, people like that. Okay. And destruction has its roots in all, the, in the, in all of these kinds of... Uh, errors have their radicals, their extremists, and they're all, it all leads to destruction. So the, the destructive nihilism has its roots in the, the extreme forms of all of these errors, because they all, they all lead to destruction. So to summarize uh, the author's introduction, he finally finishes by saying, you know, as orthodox, we can't get caught up in any one of these stages. We have to see each one of them in the light of orthodox truth. And that, that's his goal, to help us be critical of all these supposedly opposing schools of thought that all are really heads of the same hydra and seeing it from our orthodox vantage point. So in pages 23 to 33 in this second edition, he talks about what he calls the first stage of liberalism. And this is really a passive or s supposedly neutral preparation for nihilism. It's the classical liberals, okay, going back way back to the 18th, going back to the 17th and 18th century thinkers, the, the fathers of the political thought that gave birth to America, John Locke, people like that. And then in the, in the 19th century, John Stuart Mill, who are, these are right, right, icons for, the, for liberals, right, for, and who today are called American conservatives, but they're actually, they're actually liberals. So the, the, they're a passive, neutral preparation for nihilism, for the destructive future, right? And they, they're so weak, they can't defend the Christian heritage they claim to believe in. They claim to believe in the Christian heritage. 
For example, there's a, um, a Jewish thinker named Leo Strauss. It's a, a, he's an idol for a lot of so-called conservatives. He claimed, and he, all of his followers claimed they want to preserve Christian civilization. Strauss himself said, hey, I admire Christian civilization. But he didn't believe in Christ. So they, they really don't, they don't have the spiritual power to defend this civilization against what's coming against it. So what is liberal truth? In 19th century classical liberalism, they claim to love Christian civilization. And they, they have vague ideas like eternal verities, eternal truths, great ideas, the great ideas, okay? the great conversation, so forth. But they don't believe in absolute truth. They're t sophisticated people in the 19th century just couldn't believe in absolute or Christian truth. This is why, you know, uh, baptized, church-going Orthodox people in the 19th century would abhor the idea of their child becoming a monk. Well, how can you believe in those medieval superstitions? We're enlightened. You know, how could you do that? There are so many, so many examples. If you read lives of 19th century elders, our Holy Fathers should say that the, the, most of them came from peasant or merchant class families, because all the aristocratic families and intellectuals were saying, ah, oh, that's all, yeah, we're orthodox because that's our national faith, that's part of our culture, but we don't really believe in all that, you know, miracles and elders and confession and, you know, come on, that's, we're beyond that, we're, we're too sophisticated to believe in that, but they were very patriotic, they considered themselves very loyal to the orthodox church, they wouldn't be anything else, you see, but they were denying the essence, because they didn't believe in their actual revelation. They didn't believe in the actual tradition of the church. But they had a lot of beautiful emotional ideas. You know, our, our culture, our civilization, and so forth and so on, but without the absolute truth of the faith. So this kind of liberal loves the heritage of previous ages. Look how beautiful that church is. Look how beautiful that chant is. You know, I love my culture, you see. But they don't believe in the truth that created the culture, or the faith that created the culture. Okay? So they couldn't really defend it. They didn't have a spiritual power to defend it. They were just enjoying, outwardly enjoying the fruits of hundreds of years of, 2,000 years of faith, but without the faith. Okay. So who is this liberal God? We've talked about that liberal God before. It was deism, right? They adopted the deistic idea from the 18th century. The classical liberals or progressive Christians want to retain some idea of God, but not the personal, historical, revealed, demanding God of the scriptures. For them, the real God for them is up to, up front, too close, and also too great. He's all powerful, and he's right in your face. He's demanding something, and he interferes in history. He does things. He can raise the dead. That's the real God. They don't like that. They don't want that. They like Christian ideals. You know, care for the poor. How many times have you heard Orthodox who are Masons, you know, say, oh, I, how can you tell me I can't be a Mason? We care for the poor. We believe in Christian ideals. We're good people, right? They like Christian ideals, but without Christ. Their God is the deist God that does not work miracles or intervene in history or make demands. Their souls are dead from the loss of faith, even though these might be people who go to church every Sunday or every often, but they don't really believe. Their souls are dead from the loss of faith. They like the outward trappings of the Christian heritage. They want to do good. Um, a classic example of this is Arthur Balfour of the Balfour Declaration, that person. He was a, a British nobleman or from a noble family, from, the, from one of the most famous noble families, the Cecil family. And he wrote a defense of the Christian faith. And he also insisted, he, he was a, a wealthy man who had, obviously, he did practice a lot of hospitality, had big house parties at his country home and town homes and so forth. And he insisted that his guests gather every day for morning and evening prayer, according to the Anglican prayer book. But his defense of the Christian faith was completely on rational or rationalistic grounds. And, because he assumed that Neither he nor anyone he knew would, could believe in the revealed faith. See, He loved the culture that Christianity produced, but, but he didn't believe in Christianity itself. Okay. The religion of man. So their God is weaker than the men who invented him. <laughs> the men who invented him are doing things. They're building bridges. They're building orphanages. They're bringing uh, indoor plumbing to the Africans, or whatever it may be. They're doing things, right? But their God is this far-off philosophical first cause out in La La Land somewhere. So the atheists, the atheists point this out. They said, your God is a joke. You have no apology for your God. You have, no, you have no philosophical, no theological argument for your God. You're hypocrites. So a lot of the Marxist zeal of destruction was aimed at these hypocritical liberals. See, the, the useful idiots who prepared the way for the destruction that was to come. There's a character, I, I think his name is um, Stepan Trofimovich, something like that. I forget the name, I forget the name of the character, but there's a character in... The demons. Stefan. Is it 
Stefan Trofimovich, something like that, where he's the, he's the 1860s liberal, and he thinks that these young men admire him, but they don't, because they've gone beyond him. They see that his liberal faith is, is silly and weak and useless, and they're the real thing. They're going to take this whole rejection of orthodoxy to its logical extreme. Um, there's a sad scene in the, where he just kind of walks off into the distance and disappears, and it's an image of the the the, the defeat of liberalism by by more radical Marxism. Okay. So their God is weak, and the atheists point this out, and they can't defend their so-called God and their so-called Christian civilization from the radical nihilists. Okay. <clears throat> in orthodoxy, and paragraph seven to thirteen identify as is examining the question of immortality versus earthly utopia. In orthodoxy, everything is judged from the light of eternity. Death, judgment, heaven and hell, those are real. Right? That's how we judge everything. But in liberalism, whether of the Christian variety or over just humanism, everything is judged in the light of a so-called salvation which makes life better in this world. This world is all there is. When I used to, um, my secular job years ago, and I used to give uh, advice to young people about college and career, they would always say, I want to make the world a better place. This has become like a, a mantra or some kind of a, a truism. Looks good on the resume. Let's go in the resume. <laughs> so the liberal idea of salvation is to make the world a better place. Because this world is all there is. So a liberal Christian, a progressive Christian, may speak of heaven. Oh, he's gone to heaven now. He doesn't he's not in pain anymore. You know, so that kind of thing. It's in vague, sentimental, a carnal way, nothing serious. Unfortunately, a lot of Orthodox people think this way. You go to a, an Orthodox funeral, and it, it, it's rare to meet people who are really talking about, we need to pray for his soul, uh, the toll houses, uh, God's judgment, heaven and hell. You know, it's all, oh, well, he's, he's out of pain now, and he's, he, now he sees his grandma in heaven. And this kind of vague, sentimental, uh, hallmark channel uh, approach. And uh, it's, it's really scary when you see lots of Orthodox people talking like this. And if you talk about, well, you know, we need to pray for his soul. Maybe he isn't saved. They're, they're offended. It's like, how, how could you say that? Um, it's superficial. Yeah, it's humanistic. It's superficial. So sentimental kind of, they say they believe in heaven and hell, but it's really this kind of uh, childish, you know, just angels on clouds with harps and, or something like that. Nothing, nothing serious. And everybody goes there. I remember uh, I read the results of a survey. It said 95% of Americans believe in hell, but only 5% believe they can go there. So it's nothing, nothing serious. So the liberal Christian may speak about heaven, but it's just some vague, sentimental thing. The outright humanist, who doesn't claim to be a Christian, does not speak of immortality or heaven. This life is all there is. But he still may like so-called Christian ideals. Right? The humanist stoic, they want to do his duty. Remember, in stoicism, you do your duty, even though things are not going to go well, but you do your duty. And be moral. But his metaphysics is so thin, it's so he has no philosophy really to back it up. Certainly no theology to back up. So you really can't say why he wants it or what, where duty comes from or why he wants to do it. Right? So outright nihilism easily defeats this position as well. Okay? So the liberal wants to lead a civilized life in this world. The apex of this outlook you could see in Victorian England. Right? They're so wealthy and they've, they've, got, so, they've got so much. They've got all the centuries, this, the, the, the result of centuries and centuries of a Christian civilization behind them. And they're, they're all comfortable, and they're all wealthy, and they're conquering the world, and they're bringing indoor plumbing to the Africans, and um, suits and ties to the Chinese instead of their little robes. And you know, they're making the world a better place, right? And they want to defend the structures and values of the old culture, but they really have no defense. It's all very thin. It's going to fall like that, like a house of cards. Because as Ivan Karamazov says, if there is no immortality, all things are lawful. You know, that's toward the beginning of Brothers Karamazov. You meet Ivan. And he's uh, recently had a triumph. He's, had a, uh, he's published an article that's, that proposes that if there's no immortality, all things are lawful. And he's right. Okay. So the irony is that when liberals have created their utopia, by the 19th century they've created their utopia. They've liberated men from the church, from the monks, from the rules, and so forth. And they, they're creating universal suffrage and, and um, you know, uh, a full belly for everyone. And, they're, and they've, they're liberating men from the old constraints of family, of church, of society, and so forth. But by, by getting rid of all of these defenses for the, for the so-called individual, what they've done is they've opened it up to the nihilists who are going to come in and destroy this beautiful liberal paradise with their monstrous violence, their experiments on people, 
They're torturing and killing millions and millions and millions of people. The liberals paved the way for this. In Russia, it was very obvious. You can just see it. The, the, the liberals take over the Duma, the parliament. They do a coup. They overthrow the czar. The liberals overthrow the czar. It wasn't, it wasn't Bolsheviks who got rid of the czar. It was Masons and liberals in the aristocracy, in the court, in the general staff who got rid of the czar. And in a few months, the Bolsheviks could just walk in and take it over because it had no spiritual power, had no strength. We see this repeated in all of our Orthodox countries where they let in the liberal ideas, they get rid of the church's influence, they neutralize the church by neutralizing the monasteries, and they, and they, they, and they take over the education away from the monasteries, and the education goes to the secularists. And then they say, well, we're, we believe in orthodoxy, we love orthodoxy, we're patriotic, blah, 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 but they have no spiritual power. So when the real revolutionaries come, they have no defense. They just <laughs> wipe them out. There's no, no immune system. Okay. <clears throat> so the new man produced by liberalism sees through the illusion of liberalism. <laughs> they, they don't believe in it. It's ridiculous, right? Father Seraphim in paragraphs 14 through 17 talks about hierarchy versus egalitarianism. In the Christian order, politics are based on absolute truth because all authority is from God. We talked about this at length, right, in our course on Christian politics. This creates a, a monarchy and a hierarchical society. In the liberal order, authority is from the people, from the sovereign will of the people. If there's a monarchy, what's well, a constitutional monarchy? Yeah, we have a king, but and we have the church, but they're for show. Figurative. Yeah, they're they're figureheads. It's it's nice on a, on a national holiday. We like to have the king. We have the patriarch come out and bless everybody. But it's a beautiful show, right? <clears throat> In liberal Christianity, God is a constitutional monarch too. He rules by our if we let him, right? We'll vote for God. We'll vote for what kind of God we want. As in other areas, the liberal compromise is weak. It's unstable. You either believe authority comes from God or you don't, right? But if you try to create this hybrid hermaphroditic <laughs> uh, arrangement, it doesn't, it doesn't stand up. So the liberals always try to appease the revolution. That's the mark of a liberal. They're always appeasing the destroyers. And the revolution's always making no compromises. The real revolutionaries make no compromise. They're not interested in compromise. Okay. We can see this, for example, the the, the weaklings in the so-called American conservatives, you know, they're always trying to appease the leftists because that's what they do. That's what they do. Face yeah, it's just, yeah, it's just a controlled opposition. So what is the root of liberalism? And Father Seraphim identifies it very easily. It's worldliness. It's just worldliness. The liberal is oblivious to the total inadequacy of his position. He doesn't care about ultimate questions. He may be a person, again, from a 19th century Anglican or Lutheran or Catholic or, unfortunately, 19th century Orthodox aristocrat or intellectual who goes to church, but he doesn't ultimately care about his soul because he's worldly. He's enjoying this world too much. That's all he cares about. He, can, he wants to preserve a Christian culture, but he doesn't believe in Christ. So he can only, he can only preserve this thing for a short time. It doesn't last very long uh, because there's no defense against revolution. So he's a contented, stupid sheep until the moment they come to take him to the guillotine or the gulag. In paragraphs 31 to 33, he deals with the question of violent re-education versus subtle re-education. Okay. Nietzsche says there's no why. He asks the ultimate question. He gives the answer. Boom. That's the radical nihilist. They ask ultimate questions, and they give their answer. It's a bad answer, but they're asking the ultimate question. The liberals don't want to deal with ultimate questions. They just want to deal with what we're going to have for dinner today, or how to, how to um, build a better mousetrap. Right? The nihilist destructive regimes re-educate their populations quickly and brutally. That's what we saw in communism, right? You kill lots of people, put in a total new system, and brutally re-educate the people by torturing them and drugging them and so forth and so on. The liberal regimes re-educate gradually. So we can say, well, in America, in Britain, or say in France since, you know, 1800, we haven't had violent revolution, we've had gentle revolution. We gradually re-educate. And so the liberals, in education, liberals are the best allies of the nihilists because they gradually, nicely re-educate everybody into rejection of God. So they, they quietly, gradually... So in, in the Orthodox countries, they had to take people from Orthodoxy and just brutalize them and kill them and torture them and, and then put them in classes 24 hours a day about Marxism and Darwin and all this stuff, okay, and the class struggle and all that nonsense, right? In America, they didn't have to... They did it much more gradually without, without killing millions of people. Okay, that's the liberal method, but it's a, it ends up with people who are, think, well, this is something nice. They didn't realize they've been, I mean, at least in communism, you realize that you were being tortured. So here they don't even realize, right, that they're being re-engineered, right? They're being re-educated. And Father Seraphim links us to the corruption of academia. 
this is a theme in his biography where he talked when he was a young man he was just appalled by the corruption of thing he, he was in college in the 1940s and 50s well, what would you think now <laughs> the corruption in the universities universities are a complete you know joke i mean they're they're the corruption is is it's so outrageous that they don't even they're not even ashamed of it anymore um so it, it also the corruption of academia the, the the university system which was born in the west in the middle ages who created monks created it originally but then gradually it was taken over by more and more disbelieving people more and more materialistic more and more skeptical more and more unbelieving and finally today it's it's just a madhouse academia the scientific establishment and academia in general is a madhouse okay. and he's identifying this back in 1962 when he's writing this book so you can, again you can imagine what he would think now what goes on in universities so to summarize liberalism paragraphs 34 and 35 the liberal is a man who has lost his faith but he wants the outward cultural fruits of faith. He likes his beautiful traditional architecture and his beautiful traditional music and the, his beauty of, of his nation's literature. And he's a patriot and, and he's a churchman. He loves all this. Well, it might be a churchman somewhere or somewhere. But he loves the culture, right? But he doesn't believe in the faith that created the culture. He wants the prestige of truth without paying the price of believing in truth. You know, one tool is opera. Oh, opera, yes. Opera. Opera is an earlier um, form of initiation into the diabolical. Now, we have more advanced forms now, the rock concert, the pro football game. These are Dionysiac Bacchanalian in initiations. They're psyops. They're, they're ritual transformations of people into a Dionysian or, or a demonic, uh, frenzied personality, fragmented personality, addicted personality, right? Opera is an older, more sophisticated, more well, more powerful for an intelligent person, intelligent. right? Because people then were much more intelligent, right? They couldn't take them from uh, chant to rock. to rock, right? They had to do these stages in between. You can see, and in opera, you can see the progression of opera. The earliest operas, say Monteverdi, they're more stylized. Um, they're much less carnal. Uh, they're more Baroque opera is very... Uh, stayed in a sense it's 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 very calm but but by the time you get to the 19th century opera and then especially the wagner wagner uh, wagnerian opera is really an initiation into an entire uh diabol or demonic mythological universe it's 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 a uh, kind of an amazing stuff and and if you um i was taking musicology in college and my professor who was a benedictine monk who actually loved gregorian chant and uh he was very suspicious of Wagner. Um, he says, well, notice this gigantic orchestra uh, and, and these uh, amazing, the, the, these frequent modulations from one key to another that you hear in Wagner. Wagner greatly increased the size of the orchestra. So it has this incredible power of this, this great 100, 110, 120-piece orchestra. And the constant mod switching from one key to another and constant chromaticism where he's always on the edge of breaking traditional tonality. It's right on the edge of modern music, okay. and uh, it's very, very powerful. That's why, you know, I know young Orthodox people, especially men, men like Wagner, so young Orthodox men who like Wagner, I say, you know, you've got to be careful, um, but with all opera. And of course, Italian opera is not as obviously powerful, but it's very sensuous, so it traps people in a dreamland of, of carnality, romanticism, eroticism, sensuality. You know, there, there's a play, in the in the life of the elder... Um, Varnava of Opina. He talked. He was, you know, he didn't enter the monastery until he was 46, and he was a cavalry officer, and he was also from a well-placed family. So he he went to operas, he went to balls, all that kind of thing. He remembers a turning point in his life, where it was the eve of Saint Nicholas Day, and he went to an opera. And he was sitting there saying, "What am I doing here?" <laughs> and he never went to one again. He realized it's, it's either the opera or the vigil for Saint Nicholas. I can't. These are two different worlds, two different allegiances. And um, so, yeah, uh, opera opera is an earlier. By, by today's standards, opera seems so uh, conventional, it seems passe. so passé, conservative. But if you're a 19th century person, opera is a very powerful um, substitute for the church. Theater and opera was, became a substitute for the church. Now it's sports. Uh, now it's, yeah, they're, they're, that's too sophisticated. Now it's stupid stuff like pro football or whatever, rock concerts. What's um, something else? Pointing. They're getting obsessed with it. Yeah. It's like you create. Uh, mm -hmm. Yes, but it's just manipulation of phenomena. It's not. It's not wisdom. It's just cleverness. Yes. Uh, 
So the liberal wants the prestige of truth, I believe in truth, and ultimately, of course, this is suicidal. Ultimately, it's suicidal. It, it, it eats, it consumes itself. Right? There's no spirit. It consumes all the spiritual capital, and there's nothing left. And the liberal appeases the revolution, gives way to it step by step, till finally there's nothing left. The next stage is realism. We talked about this realism last time as, as scientism. So realism, the realists say, oh, you liberals, uh, you have all your phony I ideals about mankind and, and love and uh, justice. You can't prove these things. Those things are out in the air somewhere, right? They're, they're fairy tales. We just want the facts. You know, if you can't prove it in a test tube, it's not real. Okay? So realism is another form of for dogmatic materialism, which later became the school of the philosophical school of so-called positivism. Turgenev, uh, in, now the, Turgenev is a mid-nineteenth century Russian author. Uh, his novels are very depressing. Um, I, unless you really need to, I wouldn't read Turgenev. Wouldn't go on my way to read Turgenev. Uh, Turgenev is sort of Balzac without redemption. Um, the the, the darkness of Balzac without redemption, <laughs> Turgenev. Um, so, th but this, this realism is what Turgenev calls nihilism. It's a crude, stupid materialism. We will find the salvation of man in dissecting frogs. Right? Remember uh, Solofiev's joke. Um, we're descended from monkeys, therefore we'll love each other. Right? It's ridiculous. Okay. Um, we went to, our, you know, Boganyet, you know, uh, I, Yuri Gagarin went to space and didn't see God. Right? So there's no God. All right, the kind of stuff you're taught when you're a good little communist, you know, and you're taught this kind of this kind of thing, which everybody saw through. Obviously, very few people really believed in it, right? But uh, it, 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 some people do believe in this. So it's a reduction of everything higher to the lower. It's reductionism, radical materialistic reductionism. But it seems to the 19th century materialists, they they felt they were a breath of fresh air. They got rid of all those cobwebs of liberal double talk about ideals and Christian civilization and, and love and justice and all that stuff. They have a brutal, straightforward answer to everything, no matter how crude. We're descended from monkeys. Yeah, everything's material. You don't have a mind, you just have a brain. Yeah, that kind of thing. So the liberal is vague about ultimate things. He doesn't like to deal with it. The realist is child, childishly and idiotically naive. He, he takes on the question, are there ultimate things? No. He answers the question. No. We're just, we're just piles of uh, molecules. Okay. You know what you say, the person goes to the zoo and see the giraffe? Yeah. So this thing doesn't exist. This doesn't exist. <laughs> <laughs> As we pointed out last week, the position of materialism is self-contradiction. It's based on two assumptions. All truth is empirical and all truth is relative. But all truth is empirical is itself a metaphysical statement. It can't be proved <laughs> empirically, right? And all truth is relative is itself an absolute statement. It's not a relative statement, right? So... This position is, is self-evidently uh, absurd. But why do people believe it? Lots of people believe this. They watch Bill Nye the Science Guy, right? Or they, they watched, back in the 70s, they're all watching Carl Sagan, right? We all believed in this. Okay? It's the naive, and so, Father Seraphim puts his, as he often does, he puts his finger on it. It's the naive, undisciplined thought of the practical man. I'm a practical man. I don't have time to think about God and all that stuff. I just want the facts. You know, I'm a hard-headed guy. I just want the facts. And uh, so it's, and one might add, the extroverted modern man, the American character, which is now the character throughout the whole, the whole world, right? What we call the American character, the, the busy, extroverted guy who's accomplished things and making money and starting a business and building buildings and doesn't have time to fool around with stuff like philosophy and music and all that. He's just, he's a practical guy. That, um, and I might add, the, as a Southerner, the Yankee ideal, not all Americans the Yankee, the Northern American, North, the big city American who's making things happen, right? This, this ideal has been exported now to the whole world. Everybody thinks that's the way to be, right? You remember what the owner of this building said to me? Oh, yes. The hell was Greek to hell with Greek philosophy, philosophy right? <laughs> he's a practical man. Yes, and actually he's made his fortune. That man may, has made his fortune in um, high tech. Oh, and did he? That's interesting. Okay, so, so the, the materialist... The Joe materialist on the street who believes Bill Nye the science guy is an extroverted modern guy who never, he's always busy and he's too busy to think. He's too busy to think. Now I'm talking about the productive, I'm not talking about the ones who are just addicted to video games. They're beyond, they're, they, they can't think at all. I'm talking about the productive good citizen, right, who's a businessman and gives money to the Lions Club and, you know, so forth and so on. He's busy. He's productive. He, he just wants the facts, ma'am, just the facts. He's too busy to think. So he's one who swallows this kind of stuff, listens to Ira Flato 
on Friday afternoons on NPR and learns the latest that science has told us about the ultimate meaning of everything. Okay. Is, now, now the question is, is this scientism, is that, can we call it nihilism? They, they say they believe in something, not nothing, right? So is it really nihilism? Let's answer the question. Father Seraphim answers the question. I'm going to quote Father Seraphim now word for word. Paragraph 4 of section 2. This, these are his exact words. If truth is, in the highest sense, knowledge of the beginning and end of things, of the dimension of the absolute, and if nihilism is the doctrine that there is no such truth, then it is clear that those who take scientific knowledge for the only truth and deny what lies above it are nihilists in the exact sense of that term. That's why Turgenev called them nihilists. Because to deny ultimate truth, to deny metaphysical truth, truth beyond what you can see, touch, and so forth, is to deny truth. So by, by Nietzsche's own definition, they are nihilists. Okay. It's the presumption of the fragment to replace the whole. When we talked in, we were studying Weaver and talking about fragmentation. They think that if, if you study the, the fragments, you're more knowledgeable than the one who claimed to study the whole. Because he doesn't know the, the particulars. Yeah, because he doesn't know the particulars, yeah. Uh, yeah. Um, so it's a tower of Babel of facts, trying to reach what is above from what is below. We don't believe anything above. We're going to gather all these facts and we're going to gradually build our tower of Babel and reach the heavens. Okay. It's, like, it's, it's, uh, it's related to the idea that man can, you can, you can get man out of a monkey. Right? We can start with a, a protozoan and, and it becomes a human, at some point it becomes a human being. The non-rational, the non-rational can produce the rational. <laughs> the lower produces the higher, right? It's self-evidently absurd, but it, it is their position, okay? They, they pretend to be humble. We're just humble. We just, we don't take any, we don't have any presuppositions. We just study the facts. We need to be humble. And this is just reality. We just go where the truth leads us. They're not really humble. They claim to replace God. Well, they are stupid, and they're proud. They claim that they re they're replacing God in divine revelation. They're the new high priests, Right? St. Basil, speaking of the Greek philosophers who denied God, the Greek scientists who denied God, said, their terrible condemnation will be the greater for all this worldly wisdom. Yeah, they've collected all these facts, they these, their PhDs, they've done all their studies, right? Since seeing so clearly into vain sciences, they have willfully shut their eyes to the knowledge of the truth. They don't want to know the truth. Voluntarily or just... Well, the human being is a very complicated thing. The human heart is very deep. You don't know, it'd be very hard to dissect every man's motivation yeah, well uh, by now it's just they're just raised that way okay so you have a smart say you have this smart boy he works really hard in high school to study get good grades in science and math he gets a scholarship to u of m or michigan state or mit and they just brainwash him into this worldview but he's spending so much time he's got to work so he's got to spend so many hours he's exhausted he's spending 18 hours a day in the lab to produce some paper to make his professor happy also to make his professor money by the way and he, he's too exhausted, and besides that, he's, he's running around with girls, he's addicted to his computer, he's drinking. You know, all these things are going on, so he, all thought of God is driven from his mind. He, he can't, and so he, and he, he's not disposed to being philosophical or theological, because he's disposed to just being curious about physical things, or math formulas. There's no end to it. And the, you can, uh, your curiosity can lead you to an endless exploration of these phenomena. And you can become famous, you can write papers, and you can patent an invention, and you can... Uh, be Bill Nye the science guy on tele well actually those guys are too smart to be Bill Nye but, but um, you can become well known in your field but be so obsessed with the little fragments in your field you can never look up to see the big picture because you're so busy and you're under so much pressure to produce and you've got some boss I, I think I told you about our friend the postdoc at U of M she had this boss and he, he drove them so hard because he was a rainmaker he made a lot of money for the university getting big grants and he used these kids like slaves. And he said, I won't be happy until you not only know, you don't, you don't know what time it is, I'll, I'll be happy when you don't know what day it is. He had them working in a windowless lab. These were kids with PhDs from good families. Okay. So he's destroying their minds, right. Now, she is a daughter of a priest. She is very prayerful. It didn't destroy her. But she, she has no illusions about that worldview. Pardon me? Oh, yeah, she saw it from her orthodox lens. And she saw how meaningless, you know, and uh, the whole thing, whole thing is, yeah. Um, so <clears throat> the realist is distinguished from the liberal by his religious zeal. It's more of a, it's they're fanatics. You know, they have this zeal for what they think is the truth. But the liberal is indifferent to truth. The liberal just wants to, you know, get up and have his tea and crumpets and go see the ruins of a cathedral or something. But um, these people, they they love their truth. Of, I'll dissect the frog and I'll solve the problems of mankind. 
So this scientism becomes a crusade against the frivolity of liberalism. It becomes a quest for ultimate truth. So we're going to, you know, get down to the, the ultimate truth through um, studying science. But this realist, ultimately, despite his claimed love for the truth, does not really deserve our sympathy because behind it all is a, what's behind it all. They, don't, they can't see this because they're, they're, they don't have grace and they don't have orthodoxy, but they don't realize what's behind it is their love for power, right? What's behind this whole scientism is not to manipulate nature. Remember, going back to Francis Bacon and New Atlantis, this whole project of manipulating nature through technology, ultimately why? To have power over other people, right? So it's a parody of the Christian love of the truth. So the, in paragraphs 9 through 11, Father Seraphim talks about the totalitarian regimes of the 20th century. They take this brutal scientism to the logical extreme. They create these scientific social engineering programs. We're going to scientifically re-engineer everybody. We're going to kill the unfit. We're going to kill all the retarded kids. We're going to, or, or in, in a Soviet Union, we're going to kill the, the unproductive classes, right? And re-engineer everybody on the basis of science. In Russia, you know, nauka, on the basis of science, we're going to re-engineer everyone. So the, the ideas of Marx and Darwin and Freud, which are very, actually very unscientific, they're very stupid, right? But they become the realistic, the philosophical underpinnings of the scientific social engineering. I wouldn't say that. Oh, they're diabolical. No, they're not simply stupid, they're actually diabol they're diabolically clever. But they're, they are stupid in the sense that they don't make sense. <laughs> no, but they're very clever. No, no, because no, only, demons, only demons could have invented these ideas. Whether it's Marx or Darwin or Freud, only demons, the, the human mind unaided by some diabolical influence can have, have such clever, sophisticated thought systems for making human beings accept completely untrue uh, propositions. Yeah, it's a system trapping people. In, 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 right. So the multitudes may object to the excesses. Well, I don't want you to take away my cow. You know, oh, how dare you torture my, um, my son or whatever. But they have no defense because they share the philosophical assumptions with their torturers. They're all being materialists together. You know, like Arthur Kessler writes this book, Darkness at Noon, you know, um, uh, criticizing the Stalinists for killing the old Bolsheviks. Well, why shouldn't they kill them? What difference does it make? There's no God. Right? Ivan Karamazov said there's no immortality, so all things are lawful. Why shouldn't Stalin kill all, all the, uh, the Jewish uh, Bolsheviks? Why not? You see, so they, they eat each other because they all share the same philosophical assumptions, even if they may occasionally object to the excesses of the regime. When it, gives themselves. When it comes to them, yes. When it's their neighbor, they don't care. But when it's themselves, the, suddenly they, they become dissidents, right? <clears throat> so finally, realism is part of the spirit of this age. Even the idealistic humanists and liberals have accommodated realism. Even the so-called liberals who believe in the good of mankind and higher values still, yeah, they still believe in Darwinism and they still believe that we're really just atoms, right? Um, for example, all the professors of the humanities, all the defenders of humanities have all caved in and, and given in to the idea that we need quantitative methods, so-called pseudoscientific methods for the humanities, which is self-evidently untrue, right? So this, 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 this article about... Uh, Charles Dickens is more true because I've got this quantitative analysis of how many times he uses a certain verb or something like that. You see, it's, it's, it's absurd. Okay. And the cynical tone of all of our humanists today, everyone involved in so-called humanities, literature, history, um, and also the social sciences, they've all been indoctrinated into this, this materialism. Right? So the function of liberalism, going back to liberalism now, to recap, the function of liberalism was to obscure the higher truths concerning God and the spiritual life. Let's make it vague. Yeah, we believe in God, but, you know, not too much. Let's make it vague and talk about Christian ideals and we love Christ, but we don't really believe in this miracle and blah, blah, blah. Making everything very vague. The function of liberals is to make things vague. The function of the realism, of scientism, was to annihilate truth. Liberals make truth vague. Materialists annihilate it. And, and, um, and they're all heading towards this goal of the new man, right? The liberals want to create the new man, the liberated man, uh, who can vote and, and, and have his rights and all that kind of thing. And the, the, scien the scientific people want to create the new, literally create the new man with their scientific methods. But of course, what they're really creating is a subhuman or a monster. So the next stage we're going to talk about next week is, well, next week we want to talk about vitalism and the destructive stage of nihilism.